Um, hi. Hi guys, welcome to the first official video on my new channel. I don't know what I'm calling it yet. I think I'm just gonna call it like Nikki Reads. Cause I feel like that's simple enough. Kinda cute, kinda quirky. I don't know. Anyways, today I wanted to talk to you about The Bane Chronicles. I just finished it. Um, as I've mentioned, I am knee deep in the Shadowhunter series right now. Um, I know this is kind of like weird to just start in the middle, but this is where I'm at and I'm not gonna go back and talk about all the other books cause there's so many. Um, I feel like I've been reading this series for so long now. I've been reading it very quickly, but I was just looking today at like the, the proper list of like the order you're supposed to read it in. And I'm only like halfway through and I feel like I've been reading it for so long. Seven books left, plus Chain of Iron is coming out literally in March. So yeah, lots to go. I'm loving it though, loving every minute of it. I know I'm crazy late on this series. It's so weird because as I've like said, fantasy young adult was my, oh my gosh, my thing. Like I, I just can't believe I completely missed this series growing up. I definitely knew about it, like I heard about it. I remember when the movie came out but it just is something that I just missed it. I completely missed it. So now as a 23 year old, I'm catching up and I'm loving it. But yes, let's talk about The Bane Chronicles that I just finished. Um, I was excited to read this book because I love Magnus. I love him so much. I love Magnus and Alec, Malik, if you will, um, all about that. But I was a little hesitant to read it at the same time just because I feel like in every successful series, book and show, movie, whatever, people always try to take like the most popular kind of like side character and give it its own spotlight. And a lot of the times that is not successful, you know? Um, the example I always use is Cars 2. Everybody loves Mater. Mater's fantastic when he has people to bounce off of, but you give him his own movie and like it's just too much. So I was a little worried that a book entirely of Magnus was gonna be like a bit much and like I might get over it. I don't know and it had very mixed reviews online. Um, overall, I liked it. Once I got it and I realized that it was short stories, I was like, er, cause I am not a short story gal, typically. Um, I just, I get really invested in everything that I read and I kinda hate short stories, especially when they're only like 50 pages cause it's like, I'm gonna sit here and spend like five to 10 pages like just learning all these new characters, like building this little mini world and then like after 50 pages, like I don't need any more of that information. Like I just dump it out of my head, you know? So that kind of like annoys me. So I was hesitant, but in the end, I did like it. Um, where do I even begin? Draco, oh my goodness. So in the Bane Chronicles, there are, I wanna say 10 short stories. Let me make sure. So there's technically 11 short stories. The 11th one is really short. It's not really a story. Um, so pretty much 10, 50 page short stories. Um, I have very mixed reviews on this. There were a couple of stories in here that I was absolutely obsessed with. They totally featured some of our favorite characters, filled in some gaps that we've always like wanted to know about. Um, there were a couple of stories that I'm kind of like, oh, okay, like those were interesting. And then there were a few that I was just like, why? Like, why am I reading this? This doesn't need to exist. And frankly, like, we're kind of boring. I love you, Cassandra, Claire, if you're watching this, you're not, but like, so let's just, let me just go story by story. Let's talk. Um, unfortunately, the book does not start out very strong. When I said there were a couple stories where I was like, why am I reading this? Why does this exist? Um, basically the first two stories, I'm just like, why, this does not draw me in at all. The first story is called What Really Happened in Peru, I believe. Um, I'm literally so confused why I even read this. It was basically short stories within a short story. It was like a couple of different times that Magnus went to Peru throughout the years. I guess the main point of this was to really introduce us to like Ragnar Fell and Katarina Loss and like show their friendship. But it was just like weird like about a drunken night he had, about him learning to play this instrument to impress this like man and it didn't work out and the whole town didn't like the sound of the instrument and then whatever, him getting on a pirate ship and like it was just all of these random like jumping back and forth and in the end it was like, cause the whole point is like why he got banned from Peru cause he's not allowed to go there anymore. And then the last like the end of the story it's like, so Magnus never knew why he got banned. He just got a letter one day saying he was banned. So I'm like, what? why did I just read that? Like, you didn't even tell me, like, that, genuinely that story upset me. Like, I read the first one, because I had been reading, I had just gotten through the Immortal Instruments, like, Heavenly Fire, I read in, like, 
literally two days. It's a long book. My eyes are about to fall out of my head. I read the first story from this and I was like, okay, I need a break. So I like put it down for a few days. I was just like, that was really disappointing for me. Um, the second story, The Runaway Queen, that one's like interesting. He's in, um, I guess, France. I'm trying to remember. Marie Antoinette's in it. He's like saving her. Like, again, it was, the, it was better than the first one, but also I was just like, I don't need this story. You know, it didn't really connect with other parts of the world. Like, it was just kind of like, okay, if you were really starving for some more Magnus in your life, like, okay, this is a quick little read that can give you a fill. Didn't really do anything for me otherwise, though. Um, the third story. The third story I loved so much. This one was called Vampire Scones and Edmund Herondell. And whenever I got to this story, that's when I got hooked on this book because I was like, okay, this is what I wanted cast. Give it to me. I love it. I love, I'm a total sucker for like when dots are connected, like when prequels come out and it makes, it explains things that you know and you're like, oh, like that's so cool to me. So this story was about um, like, Magnus in London, I would say probably 20 years before Infernal Devices takes place. So it's like the start of when the Downworlders are trying to like cooperate with the Nephilim and they're trying to, it's basically like before the Accords really, like the Nephilim are like, hey, we need to like cooperate with each other, you need to help us out, yet like the Nephilim isn't willing to like not just kill Downworlders, like it was a whole thing. So it's like the most prominent people of each of the downworld or factions are invited. So Magnus is obviously there because he's a warlock and then we get to meet Camille. This is when he first met Camille of the vampires. So we get to see like him kind of fall in love with Camille. It explains where, where and why he gave her the locket that Isabel now wears that was passed down through the Lightwood family, which I loved. Um, and then we meet Edmund Herondell who is Will Herondell's dad. And it, it gives you that whole explanation of how he like met a mundane and he had to be stripped of his marks because he left because he was in love with her and she didn't want to ascend. Like that whole little side story was all crammed into this one story. And it was just, it's just so crazy the concept of how Magnus is like a warlock and he never ages and like he sees like all these generations of like family, like all these Herondells, like he's been there through all of this and then like I don't know, like it's so crazy to me, like the early Lightwoods and all of that. So I loved that story. I was like, okay, this is what I wanted. I love this. Guys, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to go quicker or like we're not gonna get through this. We're gonna be here all day. The Midnight Air. Okay, super cool chapter slash story because we get to see Will and Tessa and Jim. Oh, dude, like Mortal Instruments was good when I started it, but like Infernal Devices is my heart and soul. Will Herondell my goodness like love him with everything in me so any Herondell and also Jace oh my god Jace Jace to me okay I know Jace is Jace Herondell but like he'll always be Jace Waylon he is separate in my brain like Jace is just Jace and I god I love Jace but Will is like I never thought I could love anyone more than Jace and then uh Will showed up and I'm just like oh my god so anyways yes this story we get to see Will and Tessa and their son James they call Jamie um so that was cool to see um, the Rise of the Hotel du Mort, Saving Raphael Santa. So yeah, those are all like about Raphael, which is cool because you get the explanation of like how Magnus knows Raphael because he had to like save him and he had to, he was the one that helped him be able to like walk on hollow ground and like hollow, hollow or hollow, what's the term? Be able to wear the cross, be able to say God because he had to like be able to go back to his family. I'm all over the place right now, but yeah, I just, I loved it. I loved, I loved just getting to see Raphael, except it made me really sad because we realized that Raphael was turned in like the 1950s and he was like 15. And so then we know he obviously dies in Heavenly Fire. So what's that, like 2013-ish? So like I did the math earlier and I'm like, okay, so we got to live to be like 80, which is so sad because it's like he essentially lived a normal human life, but he was just like stuck in a 15 year old body the whole time. Like I feel like the point of being a vampire is it's like, okay, it's worth it because you get to like live forever. It's worth it to be stuck in a 16 year old body, I guess, because you get to live forever. But he didn't even get to live forever. He just had to be a 15 year old for like 80 years and then he died. So freaking sad. But um, yeah, that was fun. We got to see some more of Camille, which okay, this book had some like scandalous things in it. There were 
I literally rambled on for so long that my memory card filled, so that's fun. But um, yeah, there were some very like scandalous things in this book. Um, I can't say it on YouTube, but there was a whole story of like the vampires in the 70s or the 80s, I can't remember, um, getting addicted to um, a certain powdery substance. Humans that were taking that substance, substance, they were drinking their blood and they were getting hooked on it. Which, it was an interesting story, but I'm just like, oh my gosh, you're straight up talking about like hard stuff here, Cassie. And then um, talking about AIDS, like there was like a whole story that was all about that too. And just other things that I'm just like, okay, for like your young adult little book series, you're bringing in some interesting topics here. Um, yeah, it was really cool to see like all the eras. Like just imagine like being someone that gets to live forever and to live through all these different like I don't know, I, I loved like Magnus mentioning that like humans go through phases where there's just different things and different vices and things to distract them and I don't know, it was so cool like the depression and all the stuff that you got to see him experience. Um, obviously I think my favorite parts had to be the Alec parts, we got to see their first date, we got to see like him trying to figure out what to get him for his birthday, you got to see what was going on during their little breakup, like his little voicemails he was getting from all the friends. Um, very cool. Okay, one story that was crazy was you got to see the circle very young, like Magnus had an interaction with Valentine and Luke and Stephen Herondale, who's Jace's father early on at the beginning of the circle where they're all, I assume they were all like 18 or 19, maybe 20, like just, they, they he mentioned that they were very young, but Jocelyn and uh, Valentine were married. Oh my God, literally the best part of this whole freaking book. You got to see Jocelyn bring Clary to Magnus and Tessa to get them to put the, um, the spell on her so that she couldn't see the magic world and to put the shields and protections on her. I love Tessa so much and like early Jocelyn, like that was just so interesting to see that like Magnus literally saw Te like Clary as a little baby and then he like is now involved in her older life. I think that was the same story that the circle was in. Yeah, it was the same story as the circle because we got to see Luke being like second in command of this circle being a totally different like person but you see he like loves Valentine because he's his like parabatai, parabatai, I don't know how to say that. But he also had like sympathy on like Valentine for the werewolves and it was so funny. There was a lot, literally like my favorite part of this whole book I think was whenever um, Maris, I think that's how you say her name, the, like Alec and Isabel's mom, um, she was saying, like, he was like, what are you people even fighting for here? Just like killing downworlders for nothing. And uh, Maris was like, I'm fighting for a better world for me and my son. And Alec is like, I couldn't care less about your, your brat or whatever. And I'm just like, little does this woman know he's gonna be, he's gonna be caring about her brat in 17 more years. Like she, he literally ends up with her son. Which is so weird, right? You're like 300 years old dating like a 17 year old, but um, yeah. This was complete word vomit, as I promised this channel was going to be. Essentially, I liked the book. There were parts that I thought were very meh, but there were also parts that were really cool. Overall, do I think like it's a completely necessary read for the Shadowhunter series if you're just like trying to get through it quickly? No, I don't think so, but it's very much like if you're starving, you want some extra, or you're just, you just like Magnus, it's definitely a good read. It's a quick read. Read one or two of the stories a night. You can fly through it. Um, I'd probably give it like a 6.5 out of 10, maybe 7. It's so hard because like some stories were so good where others were just like not. Um, but I liked it. I really did like it. It's not my favorite book in the whole series or anything like that. Um, the very the beginning had me very like not hopeful so I think that like the better like it got better throughout the whole book like better and better and better progressively so by the end I was very satisfied I was happy that I read it um, I also just love the cover because I love Magnus I'm not a fan normally of covers that have like actual faces on it because I like to picture them myself but like this is exactly this is Magnus to a T so I'm okay with it I don't mind looking at him he's fabulous we love Magnus. But yeah, that is it. That is my word vomit for today. Um, I am now reading the Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy. Lots of Simon, lots of other fun little cameos. I believe Magnus and Tessa and Jace make little cameos in that. I'm very interested to see what that book's going to be like and seeing Simon as a Shadowhunter, which is still so weird to think about. But um, yeah, that is it for today. 
thank you for watching if you got this far um i hope it was everything you dreamed of i promise it wasn't but okay i'm gonna go i love you guys bye